Hello, everybody, and welcome to our one-hour webinar about 10-step playbook for e-commerce success. I am Kara Pluff, for those of you who do not know me, and I'm with Applied Innovations, which is a cloud hosting provider. We're based out of Boca Raton, Florida, and have our main flagship data center facility at NAP of the Americas. Today we're going to talk about the 10 steps to e-commerce success. And you'll see a quick overview slide here of what those 10 steps are. We're going to go through each of these in the webinar and talk about them a little bit more in depth. And then we'll open things up for questions and interaction. So first let's talk about whether or not your site is actually ready for your busiest day of the year. Because ultimately, that's the most important. 68% of people give up and leave when they have a bad user experience on a site. 25% abandon their shopping cart because navigation is too complicated to get through the buying process. On your busiest days of the year, you cannot let that happen. And everybody has different busiest days of the year. You hear a lot of talk about Cyber Monday or Black Friday, but for other industries, you might see different spikes in seasonal traffic or even based on promotions. Here we have a couple examples for you. A bakery that does really fabulous, amazing cupcakes is going to likely have a higher sales day on Valentine's Day as opposed to Cyber Monday, which is very high for electronic stores or retailers. So let's talk a little bit about Cyber Monday because it's really popular. And we can go over some success stories. This past year, Walmart doubled the number of deals available for Cyber Monday, and they saw more than 1.5 billion page views. That was processed between Thanksgiving and Cyber Monday. As you all know, Black Friday starts on usually Thanksgiving evening. But Cyber Monday was Walmart's actual biggest day of online orders ever. And 70% of those orders were mobile traffic over those five days, which is a huge shift in what we've seen in the past and really highlights the importance of having responsive and mobile ready sites. Long and short, Walmart has now dubbed Cyber Monday as the new Black Friday. And even though they haven't released their specific sales for Cyber Monday, uh, it, it really was the biggest day of their year by far. So why is being successful on your busiest day so important? The average downtime cost on Cyber Monday was $4,700 per minute. That is an absolutely huge impact. Some people who saw that impact, unfortunately, were Best Buy. Um, Best Buy and Sony Style had an issue where their website wasn't responsive. Because their website wasn't responsive and mobile traffic has increased so highly over the past couple years, it caused their entire site and application to go down. Many media outlets were coining this the biggest mobile fail of the holiday season. And the real issue was that websites simply weren't optimized to be responsive across different devices. This could have easily been avoided by Best Buy with some basic user experience and testing across devices to see if their site would actually perform properly. So because of all these things, we decided to kind of create a 10-step playbook for success on how you gain an understanding of where your website is today, what types of things you need to do to prepare it for tomorrow, and even beyond preparing for tomorrow, preparing for any potential downfalls or disasters you might run into. So let's start with the training camp portion. If it's the first day of training camp, you have to look at your team and see how it's going to stack up. You're full of hope, you're full of excitement, here's our website getting launched, or here's our website where it is today. Let's take a look at the first step of where you stand. So step one is going to be creating a site inventory. Here you want to know what the current state of your website is in terms of do you have the right content files and images? Are they all current? Do they load? Or is your site passing users to error pages such as 404s? Then you're going to create a content inventory. With this inventory, you know, there's different methods and modes you can take. Many companies choose to do a simple spreadsheet with labeling. Um, you can use sites like xml-sitemaps.com that can help you 
automate this process, but it's good to have an overall inventory of everything you're using, especially if you're ending up going through a redesign or maybe changing platforms in the future, you want to know what you have today. Labeling this can really help because you can easily sort and change and know what updates you need to make. There's a very good system, as you'll see on this slide, called Ouch, which is very simple, but it's whether or not this content is outdated, unnecessary, current, or something you need to actually create or have to write. In this inventory, you also want to make sure you don't forget about your other online presence. This typically is going to be social media, so things like Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, but also other directories. Your industry or business may be listed on Yelp or um, top 10 sites for particular industry directories. Make sure that all of your branding and content and so on is consistent across these and you know all of the ones you need to manage. So if you decide to change things with your current site or look, you know everywhere you need to go and make those changes. Step two is going to be doing an assessment of your current site. This assessment you're going to want to start with the simple things like load testing. For those of you that don't know what load testing is, Load testing is when you have an application that goes to your website and it pushes users. It's usually going to start with a small number of users doing small tasks. So maybe that's 10 users going to your home page. And it's slowly going to increase the number of users that are hitting your site and the functions that they're doing. So you may have a bucket of users that are simply going to a home page. You may also have a bucket of users who are trying to get through the checkout process. Some users may just be searching. But a good load testing environment is going to push all sorts of different users at different intervals and levels to see essentially what your site can handle in terms of traffic and performance. Eventually, the hope is that this tool is going to break your site so it can tell you, uh, and obviously you don't do this in production, but so that it can tell you how much you can ultimately accommodate given your current application and your current platform. Next, you're going to want to do a performance assessment. Is your site fast enough? You can use tools like WebPageTest, which is webpagetest.org, or Webpage Analyzer. Um, there are plenty of monitoring tools available that will go through and they will hit either a page of your website or even an entire transactional process for your website. These tools can tell you how long the entire page takes to load and even break down the performance of individual objects. So it's good to get an assessment of the overall speed of your site. Next, you want to know about the responsiveness, of course. You don't want to make the mistake that Best Buy made. But more importantly, Google is actually coming out with an update this month where your SEO is going to be negatively impacted if your site is not responsive across different devices. So it's extraordinarily important, especially now because of your organic search results, that you have a responsive site across all devices. So big thing to test these days especially. Next, of course, is how your individual applications perform. So you want to make sure that your shopping cart is optimized or your CMS is optimized and there are performance gains or losses that you may be seeing in any of the different applications your web presence is employing. So as a fun fact, did you know that 40% of users will actually abandon a page that doesn't load in three seconds? Boy, has our attention span changed. Um, with everything at the, the touch of our fingertips, it's very easy to get frustrated on one site and simply switch to a competitor. Next, you want to take a look at scalability in your assessment. Scalability is extremely important these days because things change so quickly. So you want to understand what kind of platform you are on and how easy it is to adjust if let's say you have a special promotion or are seeing things change. And we'll talk a little bit more about these coming up in the webinar. 
Then finally, you have to do a hosting resource assessment or a platform resource assessment where you want to take a look at all of your infrastructure. What are you hosting in-house today? What are you hosting externally? You want to know both the allotment and usage for all your specifications and current environment because this helps you prepare for the future. Then last under assessment, you want to take a look at security. What are the potential threats that your site is facing? And those are different across industry and so on. Some industries require particular compliance, e-commerce especially. I'm sure many of you have heard of PCI. Um, healthcare, you're going to see compliance like HIPAA. So this is where you want to make sure you understand what compliance your website must have and what kind of threats you may be looking at in terms of a security picture. So next our training camp is going to move to projections. It's good to know where we are, but it's great to look forward and have an idea of what we need to prepare for. So here we want to estimate growth. And how you're going to do that is by looking at your traffic over the past few time frames, which can be six months, a year, three years, maybe five years, depending upon how long you've been online. You're going to then analyze where your traffic is coming from and why. That helps you leverage what you're going to do in the future, but also understand how you can project what's going to happen in the future. Uh, you're going to recognize any seasonal or promotional patterns and plans. So again, if you're a greeting card online retailer, you're going to see spikes on all your major holidays. You're going to see spikes when it's Mother's Day, then again when it's Father's Day, then again, so on and so forth. So you can mark those on the calendar and know you have to prepare for that increase or decrease. And then finally, what, what your platform is going to need to change over the next year, two years, and five years. Oftentimes with technology, people will find that they have chosen a particular application or platform or solution that they then can't get out of two years later and unfortunately are limited within that growth. As an example there, sometimes people employ new websites with SQL Express, which is a great no-cost tool offered by Microsoft, but it limits SQL databases to only see one gig of memory. So if you have a website that grows exponentially and increases traffic by tons, you have to find another solution outside of SQL Express. Um, not a huge issue, but something you're going to face. So you want to look at your projections and make sure your solutions in terms of application and platform will accommodate where you're going to grow. So with these traffic spikes, oftentimes we see that it's seasonal for many businesses, but it's also very dependent upon marketing efforts and mentions. So uh, as most of you know, if you get on a popular TV show like Oprah, you're going to see a huge change in your visits. Or more recently, we have a lot of talk about companies that get featured on Shark Tank, or especially also Dr. Oz. So if those types of things are occurring or coming up in the future, that is most definitely something you have to think about and plan for. We had previously a customer who was uh, in the market of Renaissance apparel, and they had decided to advertise on a, the, well, actually the most popular online game that there has ever been, which is called World of Warcraft. I am not a hugely knowledgeable person about World of Warcraft, but they have extensive traffic and very, very loyal users. When our customer decided to do this advertising, they had an environment that was extraordinarily easy to scale. They had load balance systems to multiple web servers that in the event of additional traffic we could spin up additional servers and users would never see that change or behavior, they just knew that the site was up and running. And when the marketing effort was over, we were able to scale that back down so that our customer could control costs. Projections help you with that. So let's talk a little bit about where you're going to plan your offensive scheme. We've got the training camp in, we know where we stand with our website, but now it's time to get offensive. And you know, in this age of high stakes everything, you've got to lean on some experts to, to help you move forward and create a good offensive plan. 
So most of you are already established, but it is always a good exercise to review your branding and company image. So of course you want to make sure that your mission and vision are in line. Again, it's always good even if you have them to review them, but you want to also make sure, does your branding and website actually reflect your mission and vision? Are you properly communicating that to your customers? Next, of course, is your niche which is what you do better than all of your competition and what your, I'm sure all of you heard, unique value proposition or UVP is. Um, most people have heard of this because the popular one is, well, it's our customer service, but whatever it is, is the question is, is this communicated on your website and is it properly communicated to your customers? So how do you know about properly communicating to your customers? You establish buyer personas. So what you want to do is essentially research your existing customer base and identify your best buyers. These are the people who are repeat purchasers or are uh, high referrers and give each of them a detailed description. Because when you give buyer personas detailed descriptions, you understand a lot more about them. You understand how to communicate with them, and you also understand where they're receiving their information. So in a business like ours with hosting, we often see three different major roles. We see the business owner who really doesn't stay too focused on the intricacies of the website but wants to know that it's up and performing. So the business owner wants really easy stuff to use, doesn't want to have to get into the details and management of things, wants it up and running. We see oftentimes also a lot of freelancers and startups that want things set up very quickly, fast solutions with ease of use. And then of course we have a lot of developers who you know, they use Reddit to make decisions or, or social sources in that regard, but they don't really want help from us. They want the tools and reporting to manage things on their own. We're going to talk to each of these three different buyers differently because communication resonates differently between them. And not only that, we need to get our message across in different areas depending upon where they get their influence from. Which also brings us to identifying really what your influencer market is. Who are your buyers listening to to make their decisions? And whoever that person or entity is, you want to be in front of. So next in our offensive scheme is UX. So user experience or UX is essentially the way that a person feels about using your product system or service. So in our case, is this is how somebody feels about using your website. And the three main cores here are for it to be easy to use, to be visually appealing, and to bring value. Sounds simple, but you'd be surprised how often user experience becomes an issue. So here you will see 67% of shopping carts are abandoned online. That's because of user experience. We've gotten all the way to the point of where we've said, we want to put this in our shopping cart, and then we decide we're going to turn around and walk out of the store. Something happens. So how do you analyze and upgrade your user experience? Well, of course, there's the basic uh, line item of you're going to do a user experience audit. How do you do that? And there's kind of funny ways across the industry to address this, but uh, many people say treat your customers like they're idiots. <laughs> and they don't mean tell them that they're dumb. What they mean is go through your site as if you've never seen a website before and ask yourself the very basic questions that you would think would be common sense. Um, recently there was an article on Mashable where there is a very famous UX experience designer who has now offered a side business of I will test your user experience drunk. So he goes through your website after he's spent a night on the town and, and reports back to you on how easy it was to use. The theory being there is if you can use it while you're intoxicated, then it's a good user experience. 
Either way, you can also take a look at things like Google Analytics, heat maps, which track where your users are going on your site when they're viewing it, split testing, which changes variables, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, um, baseline performance reports, so you want to see your strengths and weaknesses in terms of performance to see what needs to be improved. So again, if, if it's taking 10 seconds to add a product to a cart, you're going to see an issue in user experience. And that shopping cart audit is where you start to test how easy it is to actually purchase a product. If you have to go through 60 additional steps to actually get to the cart and buy what you want to buy, then that's going to create a problem with user experience. Two of the main cores, though, in user experience are heat maps and split testing. There's, really great, there's a couple really great tools out there for both of these. Crazy Egg is going to show you where your visitors are looking, what they're clicking on, where the percentages are. So you get to see real interaction with your website. Are they actually reading your content or are they going straight to a button? Um, you can tell those different things using heat maps and tools like Crazy Egg. So it's a really great thing to implement on your site and it's very eye-opening. And then there's split testing, which is a good tool for that is Optimizely. And what that allows you to do is, let's say you create two different promotional pages. And you may say, I'm going to put a red button on page A and a green button on P page B. And an interesting thing is it's been commonly held that red buttons don't work as well as green buttons and the common theory behind that was that in our minds we are trained to think that red equates to stop and green equates to go. However, when that was recently tested on a particular landing page it was found that the red button actually performed better. Now, we can make all sorts of inferences as to why that occurred and so on, but Ultimately, there are many different reasons that play into this one change. That's what makes split testing so important. When you split test and you change, or you even multivariate test where you change multiple things, you have actual true facts and data behind what makes your promotions and your website more effective. And that's what we all want. We want more effective and more sales. So step six is performance optimization. Here you want to go through and make sure that your site is the best that it can possibly be. So for example, here's some line items on things you can look for or do. Uh, the first being, of course, optimizing images. If you have really large file sizes for images and you're not reducing them properly as the image level itself, you're going to create performance bottlenecks. So you can go through this kind of list and see areas where you want to check off the box and say, hey, look, we are the best at what we can do in each of these positions. Of course, we will be sending you as a thank you uh, the actual full playbook outside of this presentation for website success, which will give you checklists and more thorough information on all of these bullet points. Another big step in performance optimization is implementing a type of content delivery network, also known as a CDN. This is a system of distributed servers that deliver your content and web pages to your users based upon their geographic locations. So if I'm sitting in Florida and your website is using a content delivery network, it's going to serve me my information from the closest server to me. So it really helps improve performance. And the questions you want to ask yourself about whether or not this is a good idea for you is, is what kind of geographical area your customers are coming from, um, whether or not you have predictable online patterns, and if you expect a traffic surge due to a promotion or event. Next is load balancing, and load balancing is really fantastic for multiple reasons, but we're going to talk about it in terms of performance first. In a load balanced environment, you have multiple web servers that traffic is distributed across. So when a user actually goes to, enter, to hit your site, they're going to first get passed through, of course, all the security systems in place, but then to load balancers. And ideally, you're going to have redundant load balancers so that there, there are two that are or a minimum of two at least performing. And 
what those are going to do is those are going to look at your web servers and say, okay, all the web servers are online, but web server A is performing better because it has less traffic. So I'm going to send that user to web server A. Long and short, load balancing is going to create the highest performance option based upon your platform, meaning the server that's performing best is where this user is going to go to. This is the type of configuration that our client had who advertised on World of Warcraft. And when traffic kept increasing, and traffic even increased over what we projected it to be, it was okay because we kept adding additional web servers, and those load balancers kept distributing users based upon the best performance that was available on their platform. The other huge benefit here, and we're going to talk a little bit later about redundancy and making sure your systems are always online and available, is that if one of these web servers for some reason has a failure or goes down, the load balancers recognize that and do not push traffic there. The load balancers then balance between the remaining web servers. So your users have a great experience with both reliability and performance. Next, of course, is scaling. So we talked a little bit about adding machines, but also within your machines, you want the ability to scale your resources. Now with the cloud, that's a lot easier because you can scale resources with a flip of the switch on the cloud. So if your server starts becoming overloaded because of additional traffic or so on, we can simply increase memory, CPU, and even storage for different reasons you're going to change different resources. The nice thing about this also is it allows you to control your total cost of ownership. So while it's great to have wonderful performance for your busiest time of the year, do you want to have to pay for that when you're not so busy? So if you think of retailers like Halloween costume stores, they may have some traffic for theme parties for birthdays, but realistically, their main business is done two months out of the year. They shouldn't have to pay for resources 12 months out of the year just to support those two. And that's a huge benefit that the cloud and scaling provide you. So any platform you want to really look at what your options are for scaling on a very quick and agile basis. Now here are some platform options in terms of the cloud. You will see a lot of public cloud offerings, which essentially you'll have a cloud server on a, a platform that is shared by the other public. Private cloud is an option where you set up your own hardware or have hosted your own hardware that you virtualize into your own private cloud environment. And then finally, there's a hybrid cloud, which can be comprised of on-premise, private cloud, and public cloud solutions. You're going to see a mix of dedicated and a mix of cloud, um, and, and this really enables you to control cost and customize an environment for each areas of your need, whether that's backup and recovery or mail servers or production web and so on. So step seven in our offensive scheme is management. And the industry has changed quite a bit in terms of what is managed by hosting providers versus internal IT and so on. Um, even now we see this with software as a service, there's, there's many areas of management that have gone behind the scenes and outside the hands of the company and into managed service providers. So oftentimes the benefits of management are going to be these, which is increased efficiency, you're, you're putting into the hands of experienced people who are focused just on this core item. Um, you're going to see reduced downtime and risk, reduced expenditure, up-to-date patch management and, and platform management, uh, a huge understanding of the infrastructure so everybody is, is focused again on these solutions, on these platforms. You're not looking to hire and, and find people who know this in your local area. Capacity planning information, of course, with uh, the number of customers these serv our service providers have, and we have, we get to see what happens across the industry and across many different sites and online presences. Uh, of course, you have the benefit also of the 24-7 support and people around the clock, and then finally disaster recovery and business continuity. 
So what does this kind of look like more to you? And, and here we want to talk a little bit about, you know, the average salary of a systems administrator is $66,000 a year. And that's across the nation um, versus the cost of typically having a provider perform management of your IT infrastructure is the same as the cost of a cup of coffee a day. Um, it's really dealing with your stress versus focusing on what you want to do for your business and your business's purpose. So recently we actually visited a client and had one of the best compliments we've ever received. They sat across from us in a conference room and they said that they wanted to thank us because they were able to focus on their mission of um, providing help to, to the world and essentially they they go out and they go on literal missions to increase clean water and so on and they said you know since we don't have to worry about our IT side of things we can get back to focusing on doing what we do best so it was a really huge compliment and and that's what we work for is to be able to enable people to do that so we all know that offense still is tickets to the game, but ultimately defense wins championship. It's great that we have this wonderful website that's optimized, that's fast, and that's ready for our customers in terms of communication strategy and experience, but we also need to be defensive about moving forward. So step eight is going to be to look at your security and implement a good security process. With security breaches, 44% of small businesses and 48% of enterprises have become victim of some type of security breach. So it's almost half. Take a look at your friend next to you and realize their business has been compromised or yours is about to be. The average cost of an incident when this happens is typically about $9,000 for a small business and more than $100,000 for an enterprise. Uh, as we've all seen recently, there was the Sony hacks that were very popular, which caused Sony to completely take itself off the grid. And when I say completely take itself off the grid, I mean they didn't just shut down their website. They didn't just shut down their servers. They shut down every connection to every employee in every building. That means no emails. That means you have to write a note on a piece of paper to your coworker and walk it down the hall. The cost to Sony was massive, um, and, it, and it simply isn't something you ever want to face. So the average downtime due to a security breach, you, you see 38% or less than a day, but when you start to look at this chart, 40% are one to three days. One to three days can be a humongous cost, not just in terms of lost sales, but in terms of lost visitors and customer confidence. Again, we talked about three seconds will cause a user to go to one of your competitors. Well, one to three days is a lot of three seconds. Then also, 80% of security breaches are surprisingly crimes of opportunity and the largest threat tends to be employees. Again, in, in the Sony hack, which was recently featured on CNN, as a matter of fact, uh, they were talking about how ultimately it comes down to even if your employees aren't malicious and you don't have to worry about um, maybe once we're no longer there, your security is only as good as your weakest link. And if you're not following good practices, that that can cause a, an easy way to get into your systems and cause a big issue. So you want to make sure that you're completely covered in terms of security and these are the types of things you need to look for on your providers or even your internal systems to make sure that you have these areas covered. You want some type of, you know, I'm sure many of you have heard about firewalls before and firewalls are fantastic and a necessary layer. Another huge one is, and not many people talk about, is an intrusion prevention system, which is much more proactive than typical firewalling and a much more thorough form of security. But you do still want to have your dedicated firewalls to your environments. You want to have your server level security, of course, which is, you know, your software-based firewall, your antivirus. Um, you want to have also proactive monitoring and reporting. If you are required to do things like PCI, you'll be required to do quarterly or even more often than that scanning and DDoS mitigation. So there are providers today, and, and we have a great one that we offer, that, that offer DDoS mitigation. 
and also cloud load balancing. So you can look at providers like Encapsula. And again, I'll be glad to talk to any of you about that. But Encapsula offers a cloud-based load balancing that also handles DDoS mitigation. So when users come, they actually hit this service first. It also increases performance more often than not. And it protects you in case somebody or, or you have a denial of service attack threat, it actually creates the mitigation for you so you don't have to worry about that. And if any of you have ever been in the position, you can probably comment on what a pain going through DDoS is. So step nine is availability and redundancy. You want to make sure you're online always. And so the first thing to look at there is systems that have high availability automatic failover and clustering type situations. So there are many cloud solutions that are simple standard virtualized machines, meaning you have a virtual machine that sits on top of a piece of physical hardware. It's a good solution, but there are better. For example, you can have a clustered environment where you have multiple physical machines that support these cloud servers. So your cloud server may be on one physical machine, but if that physical machine has some type of failure, if the CPU blows up, it's okay because your cloud server will automatically fail over to another physical machine in that cluster situation. So you want to look at your systems and see that you have some type of automatic failover and not just immediate downtime on basic things. Like if you're driving across country, you want to have a spare tire because if that flat tire stops you, it's going to be really frustrating for it to be something so simple. Next, you want to make sure you have, of course, a redundant network and hardware. So everything from end to end, you want to look at being redundant. Um, and, and everything in life, things happen, things fail. You want to make sure you have some type of redundancy and backup and secondary solution for each piece of every step of your hardware and network. And then finally, load balancing, which we talked about in terms of it's going to look and see what systems you have available, and if any system is not available, you're going to be alerted on it and traffic will not get routed there. Next, of course, you want to look at data centers. And you may host a lot of things internally or you may host with providers, but today there is a vast difference among data centers in the world. You have some that are small, very purpose-driven uh, data centers and you have larger ones that are what we like to call purpose built, meaning they are built to be data centers, not just a building that houses infrastructure. What you want to look for in these scenarios are things like the data center security and certifications, certifications like SSAE 16 um, and, and SOC you've probably heard of. You want to check and see if your data center falls within these things. You want to make sure, of course, they have 24-7 security, things like biometrics, um, the armed guards even. So security and certifications are probably one of the most important things. Next, of course, is global connectivity and speed. The world has different areas of connectivity points and each of those have um, different numbers of connections and providers available. So when we talk about things like redundancy, your numbers of connections really matter because if any of those connections go down, you of course want other options. Uh, next is infrastructure redundancy and operational reliability. For example, in NAP of the Americas, yes, they, they have generators, but not only do they have generators, they have 16 different generators. So they have a lot of redundancy on if power goes out. Uh, they also continually run at least two of those generators so that they know there's no failure in those machines and they make sure that something is always available. So you look at that operational reliability. They also sit at two different power grids. So if there is a power outage, which they have not actually seen, um, you wouldn't notice it even in the building because of the continually running generators and the second power grid. So you want to really ask questions about the redundancy and reliability of the facility itself. And then, of course, disaster recovery planning and preparation. So having one of our main data center facilities in, uh, in Miami, Florida, we get the question a lot of, well, what about hurricanes? And it is a very valid question. 
the nice thing about hurricanes, and it's very odd to say the nice thing about hurricanes, but I'm going to go ahead and say it. <laughs> the nice thing about hurricanes is they tend to offer quite a bit of time to prepare. And in general, hurricanes we've experienced over a long time, you can, you can prepare infrastructure to know what kind of impact a hurricane may have. So, for example, the Nap of the Americas is built to withstand a Category 5 hurricane. And, of course, it's built to do that because of the location we're in. So the data center itself has planned for that type of natural disaster and occurrence. And that's the most important thing, is having those things in place and planned for so that you know that that risk is mitigated. Now, then, then the statements, of course, are, well, Miami is so popular for hurricanes. And to an extent, sure, although we haven't had one in years, but anywhere you go, there's going to be some type of natural disaster, whether that's a tsunami, whether that's earthquakes, volcanoes, tornadoes, ice storms, snowstorms, blizzards, avalanches, lightning. Um, there's not a single place in the world that you can go that, that doesn't have some type of natural disaster. So not to you know media scare you but at the same point you want to make sure that any of your facilities are properly prepared for as much as possible okay so that brings us to business continuity and disaster recovery the last step in really being prepared for online business and having a truly successful online business so the first question we get usually is, what's the difference between business continuity and disaster recovery? Business continuity's purpose is to keep you online without your visitors knowing there's been downtime or an outage. So this is planning and, and activities and implementations that allow your business to switch over online without actually going down. Um, so you want to make sure that services are always up and available and there is that continual replication in a different location and so on. Disaster recovery is more of a plan for a, or a set of policies and procedures that enable you to do what needs to be done if and when your online presence goes down. So a little bit different in terms of the operational methodology and both very important. So 76% of businesses will experience an outage, just point blank, will happen to them. What's interesting is only 13% of those are actually because of natural disaster. So that means there's, there's many other areas that are causing these outages on sites and so on. And when businesses experience these outages, 25% of those actually will not recover from it and will not reopen. And this is in terms of online businesses. So what should these disaster recovery plans include? Um, you want to have a team or person responsible for it and outline the actual responsibilities and tasks of what you're going to do when these types of things happen. Um, you want to, of course, include an assessment of what the you know, largest disasters are to you and are most likely to occur and how you actually respond to them. So, you know, when you're in California, you may not experience hurricanes like Florida experiences hurricanes, but you're going to potentially experience earthquakes. So you're going to take your vulnerability assessment based upon your particular scenario. However, the one thing I will say is try to plan and it sounds almost silly, but try to plan for everything you possibly can because a lot of people run into the, um, the trap of, well, we're, we're not technically in a hurricane zone or in a flood zone, and their data centers or facilities are not prepared for it, which causes a much more massive outage, which we saw a couple years ago, actually, in New England and New York area. Um, when they were unfortunately devastatingly hit by hurricanes and there were outages for 11 days plus at many providers. Uh, you also want to identify how quickly, quickly critical business functions must be recovered, even most of your business functions in general, because your planning is going to change on what needs to be up faster versus what, what you can somewhat live without. So your web application and e-commerce store obviously has to be up in line and running all the time, but Maybe there are other areas that, that don't necessarily have to recover in minutes but can take an hour or two hours um, and so on. And, of course, you're going to plan your strategy around those types of things. 
And finally, a communication and full recovery plan. So you want to include how you're going to communicate this across your team, of course, but really how you're going to communicate with customers. There's nothing more uncomfortable than dealing with a problem and then also having to worry about what that wrath is going to be from your customers and how you're going to best communicate it. If you have a plan in advance, then you, you have an easier time managing the process. So what kind of difference does the cloud make? And I thought this was really amazing. Businesses that are using the cloud in order to create disaster recovery and business continuity plans resolve issues in an average of 2.1 hours or four times faster than businesses that aren't using the cloud today, which is typically eight hours. And that, again, is a, is a massive difference in terms of downtime. Six hours is a lot more cost than two. So now that we've done the 10 steps, let's talk a little bit about applied innovations and why applied innovations, because you know we've got to do a little bit of self-promotion here. But um, why applied innovations? Well, because first and foremost, our business is making sure your website is available and performing highly and making sure that you have the ability to focus on what you are doing in this world and what purpose you have. So we focus really on availability and performance. We do that through being in data centers that have top five connectivity in the world. We also you know, ensure that all of our hardware and our network is of the highest and newest stature. So we use really reliable companies like Dell and Juniper and Cisco to do all of our hardware and network and make sure that we're using the top of the line technology. We want you to have help whenever you need it. So we, of course, have 24-7, 365 support. We have US-based engineers, not just call takers, meaning you're not going to call in and have somebody say, oh, I don't know your answer. Let me pass you on to tier two, and then to tier three, and then to tier four. The guys who answer our phones know exactly what our systems and platforms do and are comprised of. So you get really the best service possible. Um, we really are focused on value. So we want to make sure that you have scalable solutions that can help you control your total cost of ownership. Um, we, we do prorated billing with, of course, a money-back guarantee. Um, but, but we want to make sure that we're helping you do your business as effectively as possible and, and keeping you in business because you in business keeps us in business. Um, we also want to make sure you have the coolest new toys or AKA technology. So we are often first in Microsoft technology launches like Windows 2012. Um, we are part of Microsoft advisory boards as well. So when they're coming out with new solutions like man, uh, Windows Azure Pack, which, which we have offered now as well, Managed Azure Pack, we are part of those discussions and provide feedback to Microsoft on, on what benefits and solutions they have. So, and then finally, of course, you want a trusted partner that you enjoy working with. We like to have fun. We eat, sleep, and breathe technology because we love it. Um, when it comes down to it, this is what we find fun. And call us geeks if you have to, but, but we enjoy it. Then next, of course, we have a unique seven-point security system. We talked, we touched on many of these things in the past, but we do have a very thorough security system and can help you with your certifications and secure uh, security needs. So we are extraordinarily thorough there and offer really top-of-the-line infrastructure and providers for our security. Next, of course, we focus on management. So. We have integrated management where developers have full access to machines and so on, but we still, of course, maintain the hardware uptime. We, we are still monitoring. We're still making sure that we are paying attention to your environment and your scenario. But we also offer a higher level of management so that you don't have to employ server administrators um, if you so choose. And within that, we handle all your IAS administration and troubleshooting, your DNS mail server, basic system admin, but long and short, you call us up and you say, I need support here, or there's some type of issue here, and our support team is there with a white glove service for you. And finally, what does one, one second, in conclusion, what does one second in web performance mean? So if let's say you have an e-commerce site making $100,000 per day and you increase your web performance by one second, just that one second faster, you're going to see increased conversions by 7% and increased sales by $2.5 million over a year. So one second means a lot. <laughs> um, a well-performing site's going to positively impact your SEO ranking, 
allow more people to find your site, stay on your site, and purchase from your site. So at this point, I will open things up for questions, and I do see that we, we have quite a few. So give me just a moment, and I will pull those up. So one of the questions I have here is, will you be emailing a copy of the deck to attendees? Yes, we absolutely can. We will send you the presentation as well as a copy of the 10-step playbook. The 10-step playbook is a bit more, th well, it's actually quite a bit more thorough than the presentation, so you will get checklists and more thorough descriptions of what you need to be looking for and what can help you improve performance. Um, then we also have, let me just run through quite a few of these here. And I noticed we got, a, we got quite a few questions about the slide presentation being available, so I'm sorry that I didn't say that earlier, but, but yes, we did. And do you, okay, so we have another question of, do you know of a CDN that has nodes in China? I, you know, so I know of quite a few different CDNs, but I have not specifically looked into what the better ones are for China. I will be happy to help out with that though so if you would just uh, actually you don't have to I will actually send you an email when I do a little bit more research on that but I, I would prefer not to provide an answer without looking into China specifically because that is out of my wheelhouse are there any other questions from attendees <laughs> uh, Okay, so I have, I do have a, can you tell me how moving to the cloud can help performance? So there's quite a few ways that moving to the cloud can help performance. Cloud in general is quite a bit more scalable, and that's going to be one of your major factors for performance. So for, just to give you a kind of scenario, if you are on a physical dedicated server today, and you, you have a website that's running well, let's just say maybe you have eight gigs of memory and you have a nice uh, quad core dual CPU machine. Um, some of that might be French, but I'll get into it a little further. So let's say you have this machine that has eight gigs of memory and these, these two beautiful CPUs and you have a traffic spike. Now your usage in memory goes from seven gigs now up to, oh, we're hitting this eight gig memory. It's 100%. And now your website cannot continue good performance because you're maxing out on your resources. In order to change that dedicated server environment or that dedicated server itself, you have to actually bring the server down, install new hardware, and bring it back up. On a cloud server, you can flip a switch and say, oh, my traffic is increasing. Instead of 8 gigs, now I need 10 gigs of memory. Or now I need 20 gigs of memory. Long and short, the scalability is going to help you manage resources. The scalability of the cloud is going to help you manage resources in a more effective manner that you can more agilely handle traffic and your customers. Um, and of course, you can set up more hybrid environments and load balancing and so on. Um, many cloud solutions have those types of things built in, or, or we can build them in for you that are a bit different than dedicated environments. Anything else in terms of questions? OK, so I have another in terms of Okay, so we have a question that's, we like Applied Ice Cloud servers because we can scale memory up higher and storage is faster, but we are concerned about potential downtime in the event of a physical server crash. In that scenario, how fast could we have sites back online? Okay, well, there's a couple different layers to this question. Um, in terms of potential downtime in the event of a physical server crash, if you're on clustered cloud servers, the cloud servers will automatically migrate to another physical server. So that takes away a single physical server crash issue. Um, so in that scenario, you're, you're back up almost instantly. If you have a cloud server that's on a single physical server and that physical server 
has some type of crash, you have a couple different scenarios depending upon how you've addressed your backup or how you've addressed your disaster recovery. So for example, you may have a cloud server that's on a single physical node, which you can have a secondary cloud server that you're replicating. So you have some type of business continuity there, or you have load balancers and an additional cloud server set up, which automatically creates that redundancy, or you have backups. So there's three kind of different different paths depending upon an outage in that scenario. Um, with the path of a load balance solution you have zero downtime. With the path of business continuity it would be minimal. Um, it kind of depends upon the scenario but I would say on average within 30 minutes. And then in terms of actual having just a backup of your systems you're looking at the time it takes to spin up a new machine, so well, spin, fix the physical hardware node or spin up a new machine um, and restore that backup. Again, that's going to change a bit depending upon your site, your files, and so on. Um, restoring from backup could be a simple process where it's an hour, could be a more extensive process where it's four or eight hours. Did that answer your question? Um, oh, and there was actually another question here I just saw we, um, about scaling memory with standard cloud servers versus clustered cloud servers. Scaling memory on the cloud is non-dependent upon the back-end platform but it is dependent upon the operating system. So the operating system, certain operating systems have different limitations. Um, for example, Windows 2008 will only let you scale to four CPUs and 64 gigs of memory. Windows 2 2012 will let you expand to, I want to say, two terabytes of memory and 64 CPUs. But the, the operating systems themselves are what have memory limitations, not the actual cloud platform. And I'm pretty sure I got all questions. If there were any questions I didn't address or so on, my email address will be part of the thank you email and if you have any questions on any of these topics like I said we love this stuff and I am more than happy to answer and help where I can so feel free to reach out to me and uh, I love these conversations and I really appreciate everybody attending this has been uh, a lot of fun and I, I really appreciate that that we've had such good attendance here so thank you very much and you guys sh should be receiving a thank you email very shortly hope everybody has a great day and a